This episode of Serverless Chats is sponsored by Amazon Web Services and Datadog. This week, I chat with Mike Roberts about programming in AWS Lambda. This is Serverless Chats, episode number 47. Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Daly and this is Serverless Chats. This week I'm chatting with Mike Roberts. Hey Mike, thanks for joining me. Thank you very much for inviting me, Jeremy. So you are a cloud architect and DevOps consultant that specializes in serverless and AWS, and you're also a partner at Symphonia. So why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about your background and what Symphonia does? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so I've been in industry now for 21 years. Uh, and in that time, I've been an engineer, a senior engineer, a manager, a CTO, um, sometimes consulting, sometimes working for product companies. Um, so a whole mixture and sort of up and down the manager versus technical uh, ladder. Um, about four years ago, I was a VP of engineering at an ad tech company here in New York. Um, and we started using a lot of sort of much higher level uh, AWS technologies. Um, and especially at the end of that year, we were using a lot of Lambda. Um, so I really thought that serverless was really interesting. And so I wrote an article four years ago now about serverless um, that proved to be really popular. And I was like, oh, wait, other people like this too. Maybe I should start a company about this kind of stuff. So myself and my business partner, John Chapin, um, we decided to start Symphonia uh, as a consulting company to help people um, with the kind of technologies and lessons that we'd sort of seen uh, over the last few years. Uh, and that's what we've been doing now for three and a half years. Awesome. All right. Well, so recently you and your, your business partner, John, uh, wrote a book called programming AWS Lambda and, um, great title, right? There it is. He's got it. Okay. Now the thing that struck me though about it was it was about Java. Um, and so, I'm just curious, um, it's 2020, and you know, so why would you write a book about serverless um, programming in Java? Uh, mostly because my writing is terrible and I didn't want anyone to actually read the book. Uh, uh, no, that's, that's not the reason. Um, <laughs> it, it is weird and um, you know, a lot of the, the things that you read about, about Lambda, the examples are in Python or JavaScript or Go, um, and, and, and then there's this Java thing and who actually uses Java with Lambda? Well, it turns out a lot of people, uh, use Java with Lambda. Um, and the other thing was, it's how we got started with Lambda. So when John and I started using Lambda, which was about three and a half years ago, the Java support just come out and we were working for a Java shop. So we had a lot of engineers who were very Java savvy. We had all of our Java tool chains all sorted out. And so we decided to use Java and Lambda and see how it worked. And it worked brilliantly. Um, and, and one of the reasons it worked brilliantly was the, the system that we were building was, was pretty high throughput. Like we were processing millions of messages a day um, with, with Lambda. And, uh, and so we never hit any, even back then, any of the concerns with cold starts or anything like that. And so, yeah, it, it really just fitted in like a glove for us. And, and so when we decided to write the book, we we knew that there, we weren't unique and we knew that there are a lot of other people out there who have built up this knowledge um, in Java um, and the ecosystem that surrounds Java. Uh, and we wanted to we wanted them to have uh, a book for, for Lambda, just like, you know, JavaScript developers and Python developers and, and all that kind of thing. Awesome. Well, so the funny thing is, is that I saw this book come out and I immediately was like, oh, no, uh, it's a book about Java. And I haven't programmed in Java and I, I don't remember how long. But I said, I know Mike and I know John. I've been following your work for a couple of years now uh, and I know you produce good stuff. So I said, I'm going to look at it. Just want to you know, give it a look. And what I found was that it's not really a book about Java. It's really a book about building serverless applications um, with the examples in Java. And there are a few um, very Java specific things in there, which I think is actually great. And we'll, we'll get into some of those reasons why. But, um, but yeah, but I mean, the book covers everything, all those core concepts like 
the execution environment and invocation types, logging, timeouts, memory, CPU, environment variables, all those things that you would want to know. And it gets into detailed explanations about deployments, infrastructure as code, security, event sources. So it really is a much more complete reference. So if you're if you pick up this book, um, you know, or if you don't pick up this book because you're like, oh, it's about Java, I actually would really suggest that you pick it up and just read some of the core concepts because I really like your take, you and John's take on, um, you know, uh, just some of these different concepts because I think there's a lot of, I don't know if dogma is the right word, but there's there's people who who approach things a certain way and they just sort of think that's the way to do it. But when you start applying those things to real world situations and real applications, um, you start to butt up against some of these, I guess, uh, some of the limitations. And uh, anyways, you have some really interesting thoughts on that. So I want to get into the oh, book um, because there there's some really interesting things. And I I was I'm, I know I'm, I'm talking more than I probably should be here, but this is something that um, I found really interesting was your approach to testing. Yeah, and um, it, it's it's interesting because John and I have, you know, we actually only met about five years ago, um, and we've both been working 20 years, um, but the way that we approach um, development and engineering in general um, is extremely similar. I mean, I come from 20 years of extreme programming and test-driven development and that background. Um, and John does to some extent, but not quite as in, I, you know, I was working with people that were speaking and writing about this stuff back you mm -hmm. know, 15 years ago. But yeah, we very much felt the same way. Um, and, and while I don't, I'm not a test driven developer all the time, I don't always write my tests first. What I learned from when I, I did write that way 15 years ago is to rely on on unit tests and functional tests that are of a, of a specific type and john feels exactly the same way in fact john was the primary author on that chapter in the book and and it's interesting because i completely agree with everything he wrote in there and so the way that we think is that when it comes down especially with lambda functions lambda functions are just code a lambda function is is, is, a, is a piece of code that accepts some json might interact with some downstream systems and write, might return some other JSON. That's it. There's, there's nothing else to it. And what that means is that you can write unit tests and in-process functional tests and the, word, the naming gets a bit weird, mm -hmm. very, very simply. And so what we rely on a lot with our testing is writing tests that run within the IDE or within the process, the, 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 the same process with the tests and the code under test. We, we use other forms of testing, which we'll get onto maybe in a little bit, but, but our, our primary goal is, is to say, let's prove that what we've done works using unit tests that all run in one process. So yeah, because you read a lot about things like the the testing pyramid, right? And yeah. um, you know, and this idea of you know integration tests become really expensive, um, where unit tests are are really really cheap, right? Because you can run them quickly and and you can get that feedback. But then there's this sense that in order to do the testing, you need to have all of this stuff running in the cloud, and you need to do these end to end tests. And and I I think I'm with you here, where I like to write a lot of unit tests that that make sure my business logic works because I mean, really the business logic is the interesting part of your application, isn't it? Yeah. And I have a, I have a feeling that I know where that some of this comes from, which is that a lot of the complexities, especially when you're learning serverless development are not about the code. It's about this brand new platform. It's about right. all the services that you're integrating. It's about how you deploy all that kind of stuff. And, and, and that's the stuff that's new. And so people, I think, naturally go, well, that's the stuff that we want to test. But that's the stuff that is kind of hard to write automated tests for. That's why you need all of these long running integration tests. Um, and people focus on that. And that's understandable when you get started with this stuff. But you know, as engineers, we have to really think about wearing two hats when we're, when we're writing software that's going to last a long time. There's our experimentation hat, which is how does this stuff even work at all in the context of the platform that I'm using? And then there's the, I'm now writing software that is gonna last a number of years hat. Mm -hmm. And that, that, those are two different modes of thinking, like figuring out how this is gonna work and then writing the production code. 
And when I think about testing, what I'm talking about is writing tests with the with the production code in mind and, and really separating out those two things. And I think what uh, the trap that quite a lot of people get into is they do this experimentation stuff and then they write some code and then they don't sort of switch gears. They don't come back to the, okay, what is the actual code I need to write? Where's the domain logic in that? And what are the tests around that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then when would you suggest though, that people write things like integration tests? And actually we should take a step back because you mentioned a term in the book called functional tests, mm -hmm. which is something where I don't think it's a standard term maybe, and maybe it is. I mean, but it's something that I typically don't hear. Um, and it's this idea of basically it goes beyond the idea of the unit test to test the business logic, but goes um, more to testing, not really the integration, but maybe the integration point. I mean, can you explain that a little bit better? Yeah. Um, so the, the term it definitely is one that has been around a long time. However, I would say that it's a term that not everyone agrees on the definition of it. Um, the, the way that we define the term in the book um, is uh, that like unit tests, um, when you're running a functional test, everything runs within one process. So you're not mm -hmm. calling out to external processes uh, from, from either your code or your, your test code or your code under test. And so from a structural point of view, um, when you're actually running the test, the unit test and the functional test feels very similar. However, what it is that you're testing is quite different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with a unit test, you are testing an individual method, like a um, language method, um, sure. or language function within the code. And it was completely in isolation. Uh, and, and what you're doing when you when you do functional testing, which is a little bit different, is you are testing how a bigger part of the application um, is, is responding to the system around it. But the important thing is that you're not actually running the system around it. You are stubbing out the external environment. Um, so in that case, we would write an internal um, stub for DynamoDB mm -hmm. if uh, we were if we had a Lambda function that was calling uh, DynamoDB. Now that's not anything clever. That's not a a DynamoDB stub library. That's just literally <laughs> us like saying, okay, what is DynamoDB? What are we assuming that DynamoDB returns, and is our code uh, processing that response correctly? Right. And that's another point you make in the book, too, where you say things like local stack or any of these sort of local mocking libraries um, are essentially a bad idea. Right. Because, well, I mean, and, and, and you go into it a little bit more in the book, but I mean, I feel like using those sort of systems for building local tests. Um, great for experimentation, right? Like if you just want to check and do something quickly, but once you um, rely on those, um, then you then you have more complex testing setups and things like that. But I mean, if you are just calling an API, an API is returning JSON to you, right? So just simulate that JSON and, and test against that. And then you know that that JSON that you're testing against is always the same and isn't going to change because of some update to local stack or some other local mocking library. So I think local stack has its place and, and local stack is excellent when you've got your experimentation hat on and you're wanting to do lots mm -hmm. and lots of really quick iteration um, and you don't want to be constantly deploying your system to the cloud. And I get that, um, like deploying to the cloud is 10 times longer than deploying to local stack. And so, and so using local stack as an experimentation system um, is brilliant, but that's not testing, that's experimentation. And that's where I like mm -hmm. people to, you know, take that experimentation hat off and put your testing hat on. And when you put your testing hat on, uh, you're, you're writing a system that is probably gonna last years. Local stack is a simulation and an occasionally good simulation of it. There are things that local stack doesn't simulate properly about the cloud. Right. And it's, it's also, <laughs> a lot slower than than running functional tests that are all in process. And so you sort of have, it, it's great for experimentation, but it's almost like the worst of both worlds when it comes to regression testing. And, and right. but, yeah. but this is a sort of a, uh, uh, I know some people might find this word offensive, but it's, it's a little bit of a, and it doesn't, this isn't about an age thing, but this is about a maturity thing. There is a maturity of doing right. serverless development. Once you've got used to it a little bit, you need to be like, okay, now we need to think about testing versus experimentation as a different thing because I've seen people get into all kinds of messes where 
90% of their testing relies on local stack. And A, it's slow once you've got like 100 tests. Uh, and B, mm -hmm. they're relying on, on, on shifting sand. Uh, and for regression tests, that's, that's really uh, too much of a risk, in my opinion. Yeah, I totally agree. And then, and then the value of integration tests. And again, I, I think to clarify, I mean, integration tests are, are important with serverless applications. I mean, there are a lot of different um, connectivity pieces or a lot of services communicating with one another, right? So you have, uh, you know, API gateway calls uh, a Lambda function that writes data to DynamoDB that triggers a stream that loads another um, Lambda function that sends a message to uh, EventBridge that triggers four more functions or something like that. So there are uh, there are certainly complex workflows, um, but simulating those locally with you know these these functional tests, basically saying if this Lambda function gets this, does it do what it's supposed to do? Um, that is relatively easy with those functional tests. But what about those more complex, like actually uh, seeing that go all the way through? Yeah, and 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 what integration tests are about are are testing your assumptions effectively. Um, so when I talked before about functional tests, I said. So we're going to mock or stub the response that comes back from DynamoDB and make sure that we're doing the right thing with that. That makes an assumption that we've correctly defined what comes back from DynamoDB. And so what integration tests do is validate those assumptions. They validate how, how you expect your code to, to run within the larger environment and the larger platform. And we absolutely advocate for doing that, but remembering that running and maintaining integration tests is a costly exercise. They take a long time mm -hmm. to run and they also take a long time to maintain because they things change over time. And so, you know, we put a lot of work in into into the integration test section of the book and, and John did this extraordinary uh, thing with with Maven and those of you that are Java developers will understand this, but where we run Maven test, which is one command line. And what that does is mm -hmm. it brings up an entirely new stack of all of the components in our application, runs all the integration tests against it. And then if the tests work, then it immediately tears that stack down. Um, that's, you know, we wouldn't have gone into that amount of, of effort to get that stuff working if we didn't think integration tests were valuable. But we also understand that because they're expensive, both in terms of our time and computer time, that we should we want to minimize the number of those that we write and so we're looking normally at just at just a few that capture hopefully a number of cases um but that but again we're thinking we're not testing the code when we're when we're writing integration right. tests we're testing our assumptions right. about the larger environment if we want to test the code yeah that's why when you when when you write a unit test or a functional test Right. Plus that feedback loop is just so much, so much yeah. faster. Um, so you mentioned TDD um, a little bit earlier, and I am a big fan of this, but I am a horrible practitioner of it because it's one of those things where, um, you know, it's like, yeah, great. If I, if I don't know what I want the code to quite if I don't know what I want the code to look like yet, um, but I know what I want it to do, then it sort of makes sense to do this. But um, what are your thoughts on TDD, and especially as it applies to serverless? Because I, because you mentioned this idea of experimentation versus production mode, right? And when you're doing experimentation with serverless, I, I feel like trying to do TDD is really tough. Yeah, it is, and and I think that there's a difference there between experimentation around how do we expect the larger environment to respond versus mm -hmm. how do we want to write our domain logic? Now, again, it's, we hit these things that's slightly weird with, with, with when we're writing Lambda code because when we're writing a large container-based app, like it's really easy to see the domain logic. Like it's, it's all that, you know, there's a little bit around the edge that's not domain logic, but most of it's domain logic. But when we're writing a mm -hmm. Lambda function, it feels like, there's all this other stuff around the edge and there's only a little bit of domain logic. And, and sometimes that's true, um, but oftentimes it's not. Oftentimes we can, that stuff around the edge is something that as we write more and more Lambda functions, that's gonna get refactored into libraries or whatever. And so right. the experimentation part is like, okay, so what what is how what is the JSON that Dynamo is gonna respond to me when I make a request to it or whatever? That's the experimentation part. And then the TDD part is, okay, given that I'm going to get this request from the user and I'm getting this response from DynamoDB, 
what do I want my code to look like? Given that that's what's going to happen. And, and so sometimes right. I, I do TDD occasionally. Sometimes it's like, I have no idea what I want my code to look like, but I know I have those inputs. So let's start with a test. And remembering that TDD is, is test-driven design as much as anything else. It's about how do I design my code for testing? Um, mm -hmm. And unit testing, great, and we need unit testing, but TDD is a mode of thinking that I use occasionally um, where I want to be like, okay, I, I don't know how, to, how to, um, to, to write this code for testing. And the good news is that you don't have to, to make your code testable, you don't have to do TDD. If you haven't done it TDD, you can always refactor it for testing later. And one of the things that John did in the testing chapter in the book is he took one of my earlier examples that was not written with testing in mind whatsoever. And <laughs> what he did is he actually updates the code first to allow it to be more easily testable. And then we have the, we have the best of both worlds. So effectively, I wrote the, in chapter five, I've written the experimentation mind part. And then John sort of have done right. the switching hats in chapter six. Yeah, and I think that's super important too. I mean, just thinking about when you're writing code, uh, is it going to be easy to test? Uh, and I mean, that's where things like hexagonal architecture comes in or you know, ports and adapter, things like that, where you really are separating out so you don't have to call that Lambda uh, function handler in order to invoke business logic that you can test that outside of that and test those different things separately. So um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, that's super interesting stuff. Hey everyone, I just wanted to take a quick minute to thank our sponsor, Datadog, a modern full stack monitoring platform for cloud infrastructure, applications, and log metrics all in one place. From their recent report on serverless adoptions and trends, they found that half of their customers using EC2 have already adopted AWS Lambda and are using Datadog to monitor their serverless applications. If you'd like to easily be able to monitor all of your serverless functions and generate all your serverless metrics in one place, check out a free 14-day trial and get a free t-shirt by visiting datadog.com slash serverless chats. All right, so I want to move on to uh, another thing you mentioned in the book, and this is something that comes up all the time, uh, and this is cold <laughs> starts. Yeah, and uh, it's funny. So uh, just to, as an example, we, we did a signing of an early version of this book um, at a, a conference back in February. Do you remember conferences, Jeremy? Yes, I remember. We, I, we get to. Like, you ever watch something on TV and you see a crowd of people and you're like, I don't think they're supposed to do that. What? I, it's just now that's the mindset. It's I saw crazy. a trailer for a movie that's just coming out, and I'm like, when did they film this? Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wow. Anyway, um, yeah. So I was at a conference in February, uh, and we were doing a, a signing of an early version of our book, and about 50 people came up because you know O'Reilly were giving away a free book. People love free books. Sure. And. Uh, if I had a nickel for every one of you know for everyone that said, but what about cold starts? Uh, and it was like you know, right? Sixty percent of people said, what about cold starts in Java? And 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 cold starts is this? I mean, you know this, Jeremy is like, is the bogeyman in in the lambda world anyway? And so yes, everyone everyone thinks that basically because of cold starts, Java is a non-starter for lambda. And and right. obviously that's not true. Otherwise, we wouldn't have written the book because we would never have had <laughs> production lambdas in. And I think a really good case in point is I was working with a a client last year and the year before, and they weren't just writing Java lambdas, they were writing Scala lambdas. And for those of you who don't know, mm. Scala is another language that runs within the JVM. Um, and Scala is even worse for cold starts because uh, not only do you have to start the JVM, you also have to start the Scala runtime within the JVM. Right. And they were very concerned about, I, I, it was not my idea, but they were very concerned about cold starts, but they were a team of Scala developers. They knew Scala really well. So very, very concerned. And I'm not sure this is gonna work. Anyway, they put it in production. And a month or so later, um, I saw some announcement about AWS cold starts. This was pre the VPC stuff. So it was something else. And I went up to the tech lead on the team and said, oh, hey, by the way, um, there's this improvement to uh, cold starts coming out. And he looked at me and was like, what? I'm like, well, y'all are worried about cold starts. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. We put it in production. It was fine. <laughs> and this happens nine right. times out of 10 when we talk to people. Like cold starts are these big, scary things. Because when you are in development with Lambda, every time you run your new Lambda function, you see a cold start. Right, right. And there's this like feeling that that's like every single time your Lambda function is going to get called in production, you're going to get a cold start. Well, 
if your Lambda functions are running frequently enough, and for you know big serious applications, that's true, then you're actually going to be getting cold start like one in a hundred thousand times or whatever it is. Yeah. And so when you amortize the cold start over how many times your Lambda function is actually running, normally in many, many, many situations, um, it's not a problem. Right. Even if the cold start was 10 seconds every time, it's not a problem. Yeah. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that cold starts are not as bad as people think they are. You know, especially if they, we, we have a number of, of mechanisms in the book that we recommend people use. You know, we don't completely dismiss cold starts. Um, and we spend a lot of time saying, how you mitigate them? Um, but if, if, you, if you think a bit about how you're going to package your code and write your code and architect your applications, um, because you do have to do that. You can't just throw the whole your typical way of thinking at it because you will end up with 15 second cold starts and that's right, not great. Right. Um, you know, with a little bit of thinking, a little bit of smarts, then you can then you can fix that. And especially now that Amazon, and this is nothing to do with Java, but especially now that Amazon have fixed the VPC um, issue right. with cold starts, right. you know, yep. cold starts are just not nearly as much of a problem as they used to be. Yeah, and I mean, and one of the things too that that I always notice is when it comes to front end cold starts. I mean, those are obviously more obvious too. If you're connecting to a Lambda function through API Gateway or ALB or something like that, you get that cold start, and it's fairly noticeable. Like you said, on an application in production that gets a fair amount of traffic, that doesn't you know, usually don't get those cold starts. But even when you do, and I know I think I've said this like a thousand times, like. How many times do you type something into Google and it just didn't respond for some reason, right? There was a, neck up, a network hiccup or something happened. Um, I don't think users are, I mean, if it's 10 seconds, it's kind of insane. But I think users will be like, why is this not responding? And then they click, you know, refresh or whatever. And then what do you know? It, it, it comes up just fine. But one of the things that I always notice is I, I think a, a vast majority of my lambdas now run asynchronously in the background, right? So they're not even hitting user face or you're not you're not hitting them directly. Um, and, and really when it comes to that, cold starts don't even, they don't matter at all. Right, exactly. And and again, this this is a little bit of the, 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 the problem that comes from a lot of the places that people start doing serverless development is, is, is not how they're thinking when they're writing production applications. The tutorials that you see are, are all APIs because those are easy to test, right. um, or and they're very like we we understand we can just hit it with a web browser. It's easy, so it's it's very similar to this testing issue. It turns out that like where and you know this Jeremy, but where Lambda really shines is in large scale back end asynchronous systems, and that's right. how John and I got started with it. We I mean, it was kind of lucky in some ways that that's how we got started because it made it gave us this mindset. Like our first real Lambda app was processing events from Kinesis and was processing millions of events a day off Kinesis and a bunch right. of events off S3. Like we weren't doing API stuff there. And 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 then if like one in a hundred thousand of your invocations takes 10 seconds instead of half a second, you care now, you don't care. Yeah. So, but, but that's, but you know, yeah. So if all if, one thing I would say if, if all you for, for people listening to this if, if all you've ever used Lambda for is 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 synchronous APIs then you're missing like ninety five percent of what Lambda is about. Yeah, and the other thing too, and and I'm I'm not a huge fan of Java. I just uh, from my first class in college of you know remembering public static void main, I've just had nightmares about it ever since. Yeah. Um, but I uh, but I will say this: the cold starts in Java are certainly higher than something like Node or Python and so forth. They barely ever come into play. But the other thing is, is that once a Java function is initialized and it's warm, it is fast. Exactly. And that's one of the other reasons that we we liked using it for high throughput systems. Because, right. um, you know, obviously Go is going to be Java, like, because Go is compiled down to, to real, you know, code. But sure. yeah, you compare the JVM with JavaScript or Python it's going to be faster over time. And the thing that people forget about that is that that means it could be cheaper. Mm -hmm. Like if, if, your, if your Lambda function takes 800 milliseconds in Node and 700 milliseconds in Java, and you're Times running- 10 million or whatever it is. Right? Like that's, that, you're, you're saving 12% on your compute costs yep. purely by using a different language. Now, would I tell people to use Java based upon that, solely that? No. But, if if you have Java experienced engineers on the team, then that's a really nice benefit. Right. If you're writing high throughput Lambda systems. 
Absolutely. So then another thing too about cold starts um, is because so many people have, I think, complained about them or, or uh, I guess, thought they were a problem. Um, and there's other reasons for this too, but AWS came out with provisioned concurrency. Um, and you write about this in the book. You have some interesting thoughts on this. Yeah, um, it, it, it's interesting. And I'm, I'm really glad, like I'll, start, I'll start off by saying, I'm glad that AWS did this uh, because uh, I've, I've, I've met people in this world who are like, mm, no, cold starts are a problem, must, have, must always have absolute guarantee latency. Right. I'm like, okay. And, and very occasionally those people actually need that and that's fine, but normally they don't. And so I'm glad that AWS have come around because now I can just, if, if needs be, I could just point those people at this and say, fine, you, you, have, your, you have your escape hatch. It's called provision yeah. concurrency. But oh my word, does provision concurrency come with some caveats. Mm -hmm. um, and the first one was my very first experience with it. It's really slow to deploy. Um, I can't remember the numbers now, but I did, I did some testing and this was in December. So it was only just after it came out. So I'm sure this will get better. Sure. Um, but it took like an extra minute and a half, two minutes to deploy a single provision concurrency Lambda function. And it took an extra four minutes to deploy something where the provision concurrency was set to 50. Um, so that was really annoying because I'm used to my little Lambda apps taking, right. well, less than that in total exactly. to, to deploy. So that's that was really concerning. Um, the next thing is that uh, there, the costs around provision concurrency are troublesome for two reasons. One, and lots of people have already talked about this, which is that um, the nice thing about Lambda is it's, it's pay per use. You mm -hmm. only pay for what your Lambda function is actually doing. Whereas with provision concurrency, that is broken. Like you are always paying a flat fee for your provision concurrency fee to the point where when AWS launched provision concurrency, they also showed how you could manually auto scale provision concurrency. I'm like, wait, we're going backwards here. This is the wrong <laughs> direction. So that, that's another part of the problem is like, you have to start thinking in terms of like old economics. And right. one of the benefits of Lambda is we don't think about those economics anymore. Um, the other problem with the, the, the costs of PC is it's 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 expensive. Yeah, like, it is. It can get really it expensive. Um, right. So that's problem number two is the cost. And then the third problem that I really, uh, this is frustrating because this is my OCD kicking in a little bit where when I, when I set up a, a SAM template or whatever you want, uh, the difference between my development Lambda the configuration for my the development configuration for my lambda versus my production configuration for my lambda um, is often precisely the same, maybe mm -hmm. different by some environment variables. With provision concurrency, you don't want to be using the same provision concurrency settings in development as you do in production, right. and so you're mixing up this whole thing down into your. Uh, it's just, it's, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I love, agree. I love the fact that they managed to make it work without any code changes, and that was very clever. Um, yeah. I love the fact that there is now an escape hatch for people that really, really can't have cold stuff. That's great. But it's something that you should almost, almost never use. And I, I think the the major benefit for someone like me, and, and, and I think this would apply to many others as well, is just the sort of ramp up that Lambda functions can do. So if you are, you know, they only scale so much so fast, right? Like it takes five minutes or something like that in order for you to go up to, you know, the next 500 of them or, or whatever it is. And so um, that's something that we think about Lambda being infinitely scalable, but in actuality, there's some limits to how fast that can scale. So uh, having something like provision concurrency is great to say, hey, I need to warm 2000 functions for, you know, some big flash sale that I'm having at noon or something like that, um, yeah. that, that it would come in very handy in cases like that. But I, I just was playing around with it and I'm like, what if I just kept one, you know, one function warm or one container warm and I forget, it was either 14 or $17 or something like it. Basically the cost was, or maybe $10, whatever it was, but it was, if it only got hit when I actually hit it, it would cost me like six cents to run that Lambda function for an entire month. If I use provision concurrency, it would cost me $10, right? Which yeah. is not a lot of money, except if you multiply that by a thousand functions, then all of a sudden things start to get um, things start to get more expensive. Plus, if you multiply it by saying keeping 50 warm as opposed to just one. Um, so it does get pricey. 
Yeah, and, and, and to be fair to AWS, to AWS, I don't think they particularly wrote it for, built it for cost conscious companies. Like yeah, I think they built it true. for big enterprises, frankly. Right. Yeah. And that, that's my guess. Yeah. Um, and so that becomes less of a deal there, but it does become a deal when you, when you have, when you're doing that for a provision concurrency of 50 and you're deploying it, you know, five times for multiple environments, then it can ramp up. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, interesting. All right, so the other thing you mentioned in the book is sort of when to or when to not use um, custom runtime. So what are your thoughts on on those? Yeah, this is, this is interesting. I was actually just using one of these this morning. Um, so yeah, for those of you that, that don't know, the Java comes with however many it is, like 10 standard runtimes now for mm -hmm. different, like normally for different languages and different versions of languages. In fact, if you take them multiple versions, you're up to like 30, 40, whatever it is. Um, about a year and a half ago, I think it was, it was reInvent 2018, um, Amazon came out with a capability where you could write any, basically write any runtime that, that ran on Linux. Um, and so a number of people came along um, uh, with, with specialized um, runtimes um, for different environments. Um, and so uh, one, possibility that you have with cold starts um, is uh, is to write your own or to deploy your own custom runtime that is configured in a different way um, uh, and maybe solve some of these cold starts issues for you. Um, and there's a couple of ways of thinking about this. One is if you're a large organization and you, you have a standard VM setup that you want to use, virtual machines, Java stuff, um, uh, that's different to the Amazon way of doing things, then, then you can use your organization's Java runtime as, oppo as opposed mm -hmm. to the Amazon runtime. Um, the other option that you, another sort of way of using these things, which I haven't dug into, but I'd like to, um, is that there are alternative ways of running Java code um, other than the, the stock JVM. Yeah. So uh, one that's talked about quite a lot is a thing called Graal, G-R-A-A-L. And what Graal does is at build time, it will take your Java code and actually produce something that doesn't run in a regular VM. It just runs as a regular executable. Hmm. Um, and so the idea there is that your, your startup times um, using Graal are significantly faster. Um, and I think I've got that right. There's, I think that's what Graal does. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things I want to dig into it and try it out. It might, there's also right. other alternative VMs that just start super quickly. So I, I think I think Graal is the one that compiled down to, to real code. But in those situations, so yeah, that could solve. So then your your thing might be, okay, well, if cold starts are ever a problem, we'll just use all of these. Well, the thing is then you have to maintain the use of these runtimes. If something about the platform changes, the Lambda platform changes, you have to update your runtime. Whereas if you use Amazon's stock JVM, when they want to update the, under, the underlying Linux environments, whether there's like, we get another Spectre or Meltdown or something, or or they're doing something else to get a bunch of performance improvements. We get those improvements automatically if we right. use a standard runtime. Whereas if we use a custom runtime, we probably don't get that and probably want to have to go through a whole bunch of testing against those new runtimes before we roll uh, against those new environments before we roll out our new runtimes. So nothing comes for free. So yeah. it's one of those <laughs> things where it, 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 for some people it's going to be worth looking at the trade-off. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of those things too, where it's like with serverless, you're trying to minimize all of that un uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting, right? So why would you want to go and maintain your own runtime? If you're a big organization, like you said, I think this makes total sense where you can bake in security and other things that you might want to you might want to do. But certainly for the average developer, the average company, that is a I think that's a huge uh, it's a, a, a something big to bite off to chew. That's not the right way to say it. It's too much to bite off. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's the right way. To, um, but anyway, so I, I want to get into some really geeky Java stuff here. Um, and like I said, I'm not a Java person, but I did work for a company that everything was written in Java. So I did, um, you know, I did have to look at it quite a bit. Um, so one of the things that's very, very popular with Java, especially when it comes to uh, building APIs, is the Spring Framework. And AWS has spent, I think, or has invested a significant amount of time and energy into something called the um, the Serverless Java Container Project. Uh, and this is something they maintain that makes it easy for you to write 
uh, Java Spring Boot uh, projects or whatever they're called on AWS Lambda. Um, you are very, very clear in the book that you think this is a bad idea. Uh, I am. Uh, so a, a little bit of context for, for those of you that have never and will never write Java applications. Um, back in the, the dawn of time, otherwise known as about 2001, um, those of us that wrote software for a living would normally write Java. <clears throat> and we normally run Java in these large things called application servers um, that would take minutes to start up. Um, and we'd all, we'd all run these on our laptops and run them in production and they were horrible, and very, very slow. Um, but they, they allowed doing certain things that at the time would otherwise be a lot of work for us as developers. Um, over the course of a few years, people were like, these are getting way too big and slow and heavyweight. Can we come up with something simpler? And along came this thing called Spring. And Spring tried to still be this idea of running a large application and doing a bunch of stuff for you, but started up in you know 10% of the time, perhaps even less. And it really became, over the, sort of the next 10 years, um, the de facto way of writing Java applications. Um, but it's still based on this idea where you are starting an application, bringing in a whole bunch of things and dependencies at, 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 at startup, and, and then your application is gonna last a long time and you're gonna, you're gonna make requests of it over the course of days or weeks. Um, so people just got used to, to writing Java apps in that way. Yeah. However, those assumptions that it was based on don't make sense in a world of Lambda, right? We're not building a huge application. We're right, we're to, we wanna write a, a, an individual Lambda function. Um, we're not depending on like a whole bunch of different environmental dependencies. We're normally just depending on two or three. Um, and, and, be, and those assumptions don't apply, but even if we take those assumptions out, there is still a cost to running something like Spring. Um, and those costs come normally at cold start time in that there is a lot of stuff that we have to bring in, a lot of libraries and whatever that have to be loaded and instantiated and all that kind of stuff. Um, and also Spring does a bunch of stuff at startup using reflection um, to, to dynamically low code, um, which makes sense when you're writing one of these larger applications that's going to do a lot, whole lot of different stuff and it's going to last a long time, but it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's one of those, so th this, this framework that you speak about, um, and, and sorry, Stefano, if he hears this, because I know that he's put a lot of work into it. Um, <laughs> it. It's one of those great occasions where AWS, um, they use this phrase, like meeting people where they are. Right. And so it's one of these situations where people have been, they, they know that there's a lot of Java developers out there that have got all these Spring apps. And they'll be like, okay, well, we can meet you in your writing your Spring apps and still allow you to, to write Lambda functions. And, and I, I admire AWS for doing that. I think that's great. But there is a real problem there that developers who are Java developers who are using Spring and use this thing will get to a point where they go, oh, this is how you build Lambda apps. It's not how Lambda is designed, right. right? You are missing a big, big trick by sort of locking yourself into the Spring way of thinking. Um, when you're building Lambda applications. And you would be far more effective as a Java Lambda developer if you got rid of all that Spring stuff and, and just thought about the underlying function that you're trying to write. Right, and that's and that's one of those things where, like you said, I, I think AWS has actually done a really good job of, of giving people on-ramps to serverless where, I mean, look, just throw your Flask app, throw your Node.js app or your Express app, throw it into a single Lambda function, you get this mono Lambda or this Lambda lift. Um, it works with Spring Boot and all that other stuff. Um, it's not the most efficient way to do it, but it certainly gets you started. Hey everyone, I just wanted to take a quick minute to thank our sponsor, Amazon Web Services. If you love serverless as much as I do, then you have to register for the first ever completely free AWS serverless first function. These are a set of two free of charge virtual events that offer the latest education and thought leadership material about serverless approaches on AWS. The first event will focus on serverless for your organization and that's on May 21st. The second will be about serverless for your application happening on Thursday, May 28th. 
The event agenda includes sessions with AWS leaders like the VP of Serverless, David Richardson, VP of Cloud Architecture Strategy, Adrian Cockcroft, customer speakers like WorkGrid Software's Head of Cloud Engineering, Jillian McCann, and an introduction by the Amazon CTO, Dr. Werner Vogels. These are going to be incredibly educational events for anyone building serverless applications or thinking about it. You can register using the link in the show notes for the episode, or you can search the web for AWS Serverless First Function. Rather than just complaining that this is not the way to do it, um, you uh, outline a really interesting solution. And again, I will never do this because I'm not going to write anything in Java. But for people who are listening, um, explain this this whole idea of multi-module, multi-function lambdas. Yeah, um, and and this a lot of this applies to to any language, as Jeremy just said. Um, it just it's a little. Shockingly, it's a little easier in Java because Java's tooling is better to handle this. Um, but this is not specific to Java. So, what what the Spring, what these lambda lists or mono lambdas do is they say, "Hey, we're going to express all of the logic of one application, which might have ten different types of requests coming. We're going to we're going to put that in one lambda." Um, and and that's to us is sort of missing the point of a lot of, of a lot of what lambda does. And so what. What I would rather do and what John and I would like, like to do is have, if we have 10 different types of requests, then con consider having 10 different Lambda functions. Then that each way, each Lambda function only has the security that it needs. So it has, um, we, use a, we talk about the principle of least privilege a lot in the book right. when we talk about security. Right. So each Lambda can only access the things it needs. Partly that's about bad actors, but mostly that's about reducing the blast radius so that we don't shoot our own foot off. Um, that's, when, when people think about IAM, sure, think about security, but also think about it as a safety blanket. But like right. this is, IAM is about safety. It's also about security. Um, so if we separate out all our functions into 10 different functions, we can have much, much smaller IAM scopes. Um, cold start is reduced because we're only loading up the code and the libraries that each Lambda function needs. We're not loading up that for everything. And that does make a difference like the difference between a 45 megabyte distributable and a five megabyte distributable, right. like you'll notice it. And even if it's not important at production, it's nice at development time to have that speed up. Okay. Um, so you can separate that out, great. But then everyone says, yeah, but if I have 10 different functions, um, then it's 10 different repos and 10 different deployment scripts and I can't, how do I share code and blah, 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 blah. So the way that we think about this is, well, first of all, just because it's 10 different functions doesn't mean it's 10 different applications. You mm -hmm. can have one application and one repo that has 10 functions in it. And serverless or SAM or whatever will support you having multiple functions in your template. That's fine. So you don't have to have multiple applications and multiple repos. But then there's the point about, OK, but what if I have some shared code among these things? Maybe five of these functions are going to go out to a database. What if I don't want to have to rewrite that database code in all my five functions? Well, wouldn't it be nice if we could have like our 10 functions and then also some shared code in the same repo? And one of the things we do in the book is show how you do that, is how you build like a, a mini library that's all in the same application. And then your Lambda functions can rely on external dependency libraries, but also can depend on these internal little bits of shared code. And so we have a whole system um, that works very, and, and when you use it, it's just a matter of running Maven package. It just does mm -hmm. the thing. Um, but it uses um, this, this Java tool called Maven under the covers. And, and Maven, trust me, has its, has its drawbacks and it's been around 15 years and it's XML and oh my goodness. But- uh, XML. <laughs> but its semantics around modeling dependencies are yeah. far advanced from any other main language on Lambda, as far as I'm concerned. Like, yeah. you know, if I want to write some quick code, I'll write it in Node or Python. If I actually want to model some dependencies, I'm going to run away from both of those screaming and use something like Maven. Yeah, I mean, I reading it in the book, it was it was actually really, really interesting. And I, my mind was like, how could this be applied to other languages that that make it as easy as this does? Um, maybe without XML as the uh, as the configuration for it. But but yeah, but definitely check that out. If you are uh, if you are building uh, AWS Lambda functions using Java and you're and you're writing things in this monolithic uh, fashion, 
um, you know, this this solution, I think, is uh, it, it's brilliant. It really it really, really works well. So um, or it looks like it works well. I mean, obviously, you, you've you've experimented with it, but it but but breaking these lambdas up is definitely what we want to do. So I think um, another sort of metaphor around this stuff is is that when you're bringing your your spring based applications into Lambda, it's a little bit like lift and shifting. Right. But you're not writing code in a Lambda native way. And just like when we when we lift and shift from a data center onto the cloud, we then need to go through a second activity, which is building cloud native apps, because cloud native apps aren't typically lift and shift. And so when you bring a code, when you bring your when you create a a, a Lambda lift, you're effectively lifting and shifting. And then what you need to do is is put on is learn some new skills um, and use some new, new techniques to build some Lambda native code. Yeah. Definitely, totally agree. All right, so another thing you have in the book, I think is a great section, uh, is sort of your gotchas section. Um, and that's one of those things too, where it's like, I think, you know, serverless developers get all excited. They're like, oh, I can do all this great stuff. And then all of a sudden you hit some limitation or something um, and it kind of uh, kind of kicks you a little bit. I mean, that's sort of true with all cloud uh, native development, but um, but you call out a couple of things. One of these things, this actually wasn't in the gutches section, but I, I'm kind of classifying it as it, um, is this idea of um, using versions and aliases. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this, this comes from towards the back of the book. So there's a couple of chapters towards the end, which are really not Java specific at all. Right. Um, that's another you're... important point. This this applies to all, you know, all serverless developers. Yeah. So basically chapters eight and nine are, are purely about architecture. Um, and so, yeah, if, if you're not, if you never want to read any Java, then just skip ahead and, and read those chapters of the book. Um, um, yeah, so versions and aliases are, you know, for those of you that have been using Lambda a while, you'll know have been there since very early on, not quite the beginning, but, but, but very early on. Um, and um, they are useful for, do, for when you're using Lambda's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the the um, A/B testing, canary testing, right. canary yes, release, canary, yeah. canary deployments, and things like that. Yeah, sure. They're really useful for that. But when they would when when AWS created them first, I think what they were trying to do was it was a sort of another one of these sort of meeting people where they are things where, um, when people deploy applications, they sort of have a they're deploying uh, the test version of their app and the, and the production version of their app, but sort of treating them as one thing. And so you would have, even back then with API Gateway, you'd have multiple stages. You would have your production stage and your testing right. stage and development stage. Um, because people weren't sort of used to this idea of ephemeral or isolated stacks, as mm -hmm. we now think about it. But where, where what I tend to use now is instead of just deploying a different version of a function, I'll deploy a t an entirely different set of resources. So if I yeah. want my production Lambda versus my test Lambda, they're going to probably be in two different AWS accounts, let right. alone right. two different st stacks. And so I think where where people sort of got stuck a little bit with, with versions and aliases was like, oh, so I have to have my my test and my production are the same the same Lambda functions, but and it all got very confusing. And I'm like, yes, it's all very confusing. Don't do that. Right. If If what you want to do is gradual release of production Lambda, sure use the same Lambda function. But if you want your acceptance testing Lambda versus your production Lambda, just, just two different Lambda functions to deploy just, them separately. And right. especially what, that, what that requires is having your infrastructure as code down. Like you really need to have automated deployment. Um, but if you're not doing that, you really shouldn't be doing serverless development anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, the other thing about uh, aliases or versions is that provision concurrency has to attach directly to a version. Yes. Yeah, I forgot about that. That's a, another provision concurrency thing. Um, and and if you're and again, if you're using um, the the canary release stuff um, that comes with uh, Sam and Lambda, that requires an alias as well. But that's that that makes sense, and and I'm yeah. I'm down with that usage of it. Yeah. No, I agree. The traffic shifting stuff is actually it's really really cool if you've never if you've never played around with it, and it and uh, there's a bunch of great plugins that just handle it automatically for you too. So it's definitely something to check out. Um, so another one of your gutches in the gutches section was uh, at least once delivery, which is something that uh, I think people who are new to distributed systems in general um, can get bitten by. Yeah. Um, 
and 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 Amazon have started taking more stick for this, and I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of with the people giving Amazon stick for this. I think that there should be there should be a switch for this now. Um, so yeah, so the idea is that uh, Lambda, uh, your Lambda functions respond to events, and Amazon guarantee that should an event that is configured to, to, to be attached to your Lambda function occurs, when that event occurs, your Lambda function will be called. They guarantee it will be called. What they don't guarantee is how many times it will be called. Mm -hmm. Almost every time, there'll be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the event occurring and your Lambda function being called. But sometimes your Lambda function will be called twice. Um, okay, what's the big deal? Well, what if your Lambda function was uh, charging your credit card, right? Right. You wouldn't want to be charging people twice. Well, not if you wanted to keep your business anyway. Um, uh, you know, so that's obviously extreme, but there's a lot of places where you don't want to do something twice. Not, well, that's what your initial thinking may be when you're designing code. Uh, and so when you're writing Lambda, uh, you have to be cognizant about the fact if, if, you're, if your Lambda function is making any change to an external downstream environment, in that if it's not just returning something, if it's actually like updating DynamoDB or writing a file out to S3 or calling an external service, if it's doing any of those things, you have to be aware that your Lambda function may be called multiple times. Right. And there are ways that you can manage this, uh, which we go into in the book. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's just this idea of building building idempotent operations yeah. um, and understanding that. And it's funny, I mean, the billing your credit card twice thing, um, you know, I think Stripe has this figured out pretty well. They have a idempotent ID that you can send in with every uh, with every API call. Uh, you know, and you can use something like a message ID or something like that that would wouldn't um, uh, you know would would be unique to each individual event right. that it it won't you know won't double charge that card or whatever. But I, I do think that's interesting. And, and you outline some strategies like you know DynamoDB lock tables and some of those other things. Um, so that's certainly interesting. Now the last thing I want to get to though, because this is something that I'm passionate about. Um, I I, uh, I do an entire talk on this um, when it comes to serverless, and and that's the impact of uh, Lambda scaling on downstream systems. Yeah, this is a this is a big deal where you're building what we call hybrid serverless non serverless systems. Mm -hmm. So really really easy ex example to describe is if you have a Lambda function and it's in front of a SQL database. Um, one of the really awesome things about Lambda is that it will by default scale a thousand instances wide. So a thousand, a thousand concurrency. One of the terrible things about Lambda when it's connecting to a, a SQL database is that it will automatically scale a thousand instances wide, <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> right? And and if you're not careful, that could take down your your non-serverless infrastructure components, or your downstream um, APIs, or, or your whatever, quotas, yeah. or whatever else. Yeah. yeah. Or 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 logging systems that you haven't right. thought about, and all that kind of stuff. And so. Um, yeah, it can have a, a real impact, and you have to. It's one of those things again where that's what it's that's what it is. You just have to be aware about that. It's it's a lambda is a different way of architecting systems, and this is the kind of thing I've tried to like. I've talked about for years. I mean, you talk about talking about this, but like when you look at lambda code, it looks like the same code that we've been writing for years. Right. When you look at lambda architecture, it's drastically different to what we've been building for years. The difference between writing stuff in a container and writing stuff that was running on bare metal. It, from an architectural point of view, there's been this gradual evolution through cloud native, through VMs to containers, not that much different. Right. When you're architecting for Lambda, you have to think very, very, very differently. And, and I think people don't necessarily realize that because the code's easy and it's like, yes, but we've shifted the mental effort from the code to architecture. And now everyone needs to be an architect. And I think that's a good thing, right? I, I think I that we, you know, ma making architecture not this thing that exists in this ivory tower and bringing it to, to all engineers is a wonderful thing because engineers that are building the systems are much better able to, to make optimization decisions than someone that's completely removed, right. right? So that's a good thing. But the flip side is that, you know, people need to learn architecture now. We need to learn about the architectural trade-offs that come when you build distributed systems. 
Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think that's a good exercise, though, for developers who are uh, are getting into serverless to start looking at that. And and then the thing I loved about the book was that you, you outlined, I think, four or five different strategies um, of being able to mitigate those downstream, um, you know, those downstream issues, which are, uh, are are something you definitely have to think about because no, I, I don't know many people who are building entirely serverless applications where every piece of the every piece of the infrastructure scales uh, just like Lambda does. So certainly something to think about. Um, all right. So anything else? Uh, anything else about the book we should know? Uh, it's amazing. It's awesome. Everybody should buy it. Um, <laughs> it's uh, you know it was interesting. We um, we spent a long time on it for for various reasons. Um, but one of the nice things that came through at the end because we uh, we delayed it was that at ServiceConf New York October last year, I think it was, mm -hmm. yep. um, I bumped into to Tim Wagner, who I know pretty well by this point. You know, Tim Tim developed and, and ran the Lambda team, for those of you who don't know, for, for, a couple of years, for a number of years. And so I was chatting to Tim and I was telling him about the book and I was like, hey, would you be willing to write the foreword to our book? Um, and he said, of course. And he he meant it. And uh, so, so Tim wrote the foreword to our book, um, which in and of itself was 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 great. And I'm I'm very appreciative that we have that introduction there with Tim, who, if anyone knows anything about running Lambda in the enterprise, it's Tim because he does. That's what he right. designed Lambda for, right? Right. Um, but what also happened was this is a story. So I'm sitting <laughs> on the plane to reinvent, and uh, I'm doing the final. Read, view, read through of our, of our tech draft. We've had all the input from our tech reviewers. John and I have applied all the changes. I'm reading the final thing that we're gonna give over to O'Reilly so they can start doing proofreading. Um, I turn on my plane at the end of the flight and there's an email from Tim and uh, in, which has his forward to look at. What it also has that I wasn't expecting was 15 pages of technology review or technical <laughs> review for the book. <laughs> So the book would have come out six weeks to eight weeks earlier than it did, sure. apart from the fact that Tim gave us this extraordinary, um, extraordinarily useful uh, tech review feedback. And, and we right. incorporated a lot of those changes. Um, and things like, for example, prov provision concurrency, which was announced around that time, that came into the book because Tim was like, yeah, you really should include provision provision concurrency right. in here and a number of other stuff as well. So. Um, so yeah, Tim Tim was very much involved with it and, and we're very appreciative to him for that. Yeah. Well, if you're going to have somebody write your forward or review your book, I, I would say Tim Wagner is a, uh, uh, about Lambda anyways, is a, a very, very good source. And and I actually read it. I read the forward. Uh, it, it's actually, it, the forward itself is just worth reading <laughs> because it uh, actually is, is is really interesting and gives some good insight. But um, so seriously, I, I mean, the book itself, like I said, if you're a Java developer and you want to write Lambda functions, uh, go pick it up. If you're not a Java developer and you just want to learn more about serverless and get some insight from two very, very smart people in the industry, um, you know, pick up the book, take a look at it. It's on O'Reilly.com. If you've got a subscription, you can read it there. Um, excellent book, very well written, lots of awesome stuff in there. So thank you and 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 thank John for me as well uh, for writing it. As I think anytime there's good accurate serverless content out there um you know it's uh it, it really is a gift to to people who are who are trying to adopt this crazy new thing um so if people want to get uh, a hold of you or uh, find out more about what you're working on how do they do that uh yeah we have a couple of ways uh so our website and the, mo the thing that's updated most on our website is our blog so if you go to blog.symphonia.io there's a bunch of stuff on there and just symphonia.io shows what we do, uh, has a link to the book. Um, if you want to take a quick look at the book and not sure what you want to, what, what you want to do, uh, O'Reilly, um, who, who it's published with, have this nice thing where you can get a, a one week, I think, free subscription to their online mm -hmm. uh, platform. So you can go on there and, and look at our book uh, for a week. And then if you like it, you can either subscribe fully or, or, or buy a copy of the book. Um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, at Mike B. Roberts, which I guess will be in the links for, for this yes. uh, podcast, <laughs> um, which will be a combination of uh, tech stuff and uh, New York theater and my cat. Um, and uh, not as much theater at the moment because, you know, obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> but uh, yep. And then we're also on Twitter at Symphonia Cloud. Awesome. All right. Well, I will get all of that into the show notes. Thanks again, Mike. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, everybody. 
And that's this week's serverless chat. I want to give a huge thank you to Mike Roberts for being my guest this week and to our sponsors, Amazon Web Services and Datadog. If you want to check out the show notes and a full transcript of this episode, you can find them at serverlesschats.com slash 47. For more serverless chats, subscribe, check us out on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can connect with me on Twitter, at Jeremy underscore daily. And if you want to keep up to date on everything serverless, make sure you subscribe to the Off by None newsletter at offbynone.io. Thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to chatting with all of you again next week.